Jackson. Welcome to Behind the Tune. How are you? Very happy to be here and I'm fantastic. Thank you. Yes, you've just come off a crazy year and a pretty hectic start to the year. Yeah. How are you feeling? I feel I feel ready and charged for 2024. How was your 2023? If you could sum it up in one word, how would you describe it? It was a roller coaster. Roller coaster. <laughs> like, but a great one. Like Why is that? Yeah, it was uh, a dream world roller coaster. <laughs> but that was fantastic. Which one would you compare it to? Oh, I haven't been too long. It's been a long time. Maybe the, the water log one. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it's like calm, calm, and then at the end of it, it just... <laughs> yeah. At the end, it was a massive crescendo. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah 2023 was uh, was crazy. I thought 2022 was amazing. Um, I wasn't sure how I was going to top 2022. Prior to that was COVID, obviously, and no one was really doing anything at all. So, but yeah, I just... Um, just feel very, very blessed by the opportunities that came my way in 2023. And it just kept on delivering month by month and then <laughs> all the way through to December. And then the last four or five days, <laughs> this is absolute chaos in the best way possible. Yeah, because you played yeah. Beyond the Valley, you played Lost Paradise. Yeah, I actually had like six shows in the space of those four days. <laughs> um, obviously, Beyond the Valley and, and Lost Paradise were the um, most public ones. Um and the most footage kind of appeared from those. Uh, I also did another set at Lost Paradise for the small uh, fella stage. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. like a more intimate thing mm -hmm. for like, uh, I don't know, like 300 people were there. It was a vibe. And then um, I taught a DJing 101 uh, course. Um, at Lost Paradise? At Lost Paradise, yeah. Like one of their workshops? Yeah, I did a workshop and I had way more people than I expected to turn up. <laughs> That's, I, good you know, that's a good thing. I was like, DJ 101, this is going to be like easy, 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 easy. And then like an hour before, I was like, maybe I should make some notes so <laughs> I can like have something, uh, you know, an order of which to teach. And thank God I did because there's like, uh, I don't know, maybe like 70 or 80 people turned up. Oh, wow. And what day uh, was that? That was on the 30, no, the 29th. Right. Okay. So the, the first, first festival official day. day. Yeah. The, it was the day before and the first official day was the 29th. Yeah. How was, how is, because obviously you've taught classes before and we'll get into that, that you, you know, you, you teach production, uh, production. Yeah. How was it teaching it at a festival? <laughs> I'm used to one-on-one, -on -one, mm. but like you, you stand there and then you've got all these, you've got the decks in front of you. I don't usually teach DJing or teach music production. Oh, right. You were teaching DJing. You were teaching, I was teaching DJing, DJing yeah, in, right, this, right. In, in this occasion, in this, you know, and then I, I, mean, I was standing, I was like, okay, decks, 70 people sitting down, how do I make this work? <laughs> and everyone's skill levels are at different points. You know, so I'm like, I don't want to be, you know, spelling out the basics to someone who's already quite advanced. So mm. I try and figure out where to meet. So I kind of like talked about the psychology behind DJing, why we do it, the reasons why we DJ, you know, what we're trying to achieve when we're mixing music and creating a seamless flow and making people feel comfortable and relaxed and, kind of a bit of the ethos and, you know, a little bit of um, philosophy behind why we DJ. Or, right. Yeah. So that was that was the first part of the lesson. Then I got everyone to come up and crowd around and I just... <laughs> went to work. <laughs> went to work. <laughs> we went to work. And everyone was... You know, it's, it's funny because you're like trying to make jokes and things. You're looking around and everyone's like, like looking at you like this and like, like that. And you're like, well, I hope that... Like, uh, you just hope that, you know, they're learning something. Yeah, right. Trying to make it lighthearted, but you're trying to make it informative. Um, I had a lot of people reach out afterwards and say they um, really enjoyed it, so, which is nice. That's good. Yeah. Would you, do you reckon you'd explore the possibilities of maybe extending your production lessons to just DJing or? <laughs> um, I prefer to teach production. Production. Because it's something I'm more passionate about. DJing uh, is... Like there's a limited, it's very limited as what you can teach people with mm -hmm. DJing. Um, although it's great. I think production is more where I excel. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, we'll get into that because mm. obviously touted as a very talented producer <laughs> from Sydney. But we'll talk Thank about you. your sort of review of 2023 and sort of any memorable, memorable moments you had from 2023. Well, that's something that's shaped 2023 to be the year that it was. I think early in the year, I had some I had some really cool. Um, I mean, we did a little 
a little festival called Secret Valley uh, in May, um, which I I curate the lineup for, and it's like 500 packs capacity. It's like a small boutique thing out in Mudgee. Um, that was really special. Like Mudgee. Mudgee. Like yeah. Like yeah. 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 So um, just this kind of like little community, like a little. It's like a doof, but like quite well set up, you know. And um, so there was that and I got to, you know, I kind of get to book about 32 hours of music and it's mostly just really good friends in the industry who I um, who I love and some up and coming artists who, you know, get to support and give them their first maybe like festival gig, you know. So that was a real highlight for me, uh, helping pull that together. That came off really well. Um, so like the first first little big event of 2023 for you this is the first little thing that i was like fully involved with musically and i, I played as well and but it was more it's kind of like curating and booking your lineup as like djing djs mm, okay. <laughs> you know you're like you get to place people and slot people into a spot where you think that they would thrive and deliver the best quality of music and um i have a lot of faith in these people and i believe in what they can do and and everyone just delivered like the most amazing set one after another and everything just complemented one another. There was no like someone just, just getting on and going rogue and just everyone being like, what the hell is going on? Which is happens at almost every festival I go to now, you know, people like what's going on with the music, but uh, it was just seamless all the way through, which was mm. really amazing. I was really blown away. Um, my friend Kelly T, Cassette, Danny B, Alex Dowsing, Jose, um, Sebastian, who's the booker, um, who for finally tuned. For finally tuned. He played on it as well. <laughs> he played. I got him to play. <laughs> I owe him a favor because he gets me so many gigs, and um, I put him on, having never heard him before. I only heard reviews, and he just delivered the most amazing set. The place was pumping. That's great. And he was dressed like an evil villain, like his outfit. <laughs> so he was just like dropping these huge bangers, looking around at me, going like that's right I was just like career change <laughs> I was like what <laughs> so he's back on this year I'm actually I'm actually working on booking it now while well, I've finished the bookings for this time for this round and it's um happening again on Anzac that's awesome in April yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's interesting you say that you sort of curated it in a way that it's very seamless yeah because a lot of festivals as you obviously know yourself you know, you have like a DJ who plays house music and then right after them, they'd put like a techno DJ on, mm. which is, as you said, it's chaotic, but for festivals, there's not really any rules with transitioning between, but why did you sort of, for a festival as well, mm. decide to just make that sort of seamless progression? Well, in my opinion, like the energy builds throughout the day. It doesn't, it's not just one set, you know, music over the course of eight hours is you know, you, you watch a crowd leaning in in the first two hours. You watch them kind of like feeling relaxed over the four hours and you watch them, you know, and they slowly get more and more excited and a feeling of anticipation, mm. uh, being excited for what's next, but also enjoying what's happening now. And you see people just kind of like leaning into the music and, and embracing, you know, stuff they've never heard before if you're not like giving them big changes and big shifts, you know. So each artist would like, do their amazing unique thing and the next one would come on and do something to complement it but then still their very own style and it would just build from strength to strength and the energy would build throughout the day and whoever was booked you know for the later slots would understand that they need to bring that level of energy for the later sets and the and the bigger moments maybe you know um and everyone just delivered and and to see a crowd just on that journey over eight hours or 10 hours worth of music and then reach the pinnacle and then the end. And it was just so satisfying. Everyone was just like walking away, just stoked, hmm. you know, and just feeling like that it had a musical experience, not just, you know, partied and, you know, and just being at a festival with friends, but like feeling like that had a, a musical experience rather that doesn't just happen over the course of two hours or one and a half hours. It happens over the course of eight right. or more, you know? Yeah. And I feel like, I don't know if this is true or not, but festivals deliberately put uh, an act that doesn't make sense of another act next to each other because they want patrons to move around the festival and spend money. 
That actually, yeah, that's a good point. So they go, oh, I'll put this house act on, and I'm going to put like you know Party Boy '69 on, and then everyone will just move, and then they'll just do the same thing on the other stage. So the the way they do it is so that people are constantly walking around the festival, mm. buying drinks and spending money. So just exposing the whole festival industry. <laughs> <laughs> Could be wrong. Could be wrong, but I don't understand why you wouldn't just have like a seamless flow of music. Mm. But I'm not a professional. So. Yeah, I mean that's that's actually a really good point you bring up. Like, you you obviously value that progression and mm. experience. That's something mm. that you sort of inco- obviously I'm assuming you incorporate it into your own sets. But how do you do it for say an hour or two instead of you create like an eight hour journey I mean, for an hour for like I mean like I um, generally don't take anything less than an hour and a half, mm-hmm. um, which I think is still very short. Two hours is great. Three hours is better. Um, for me, I've always tried to hold on to the concept of a journey within my sets rather than just trying to bring a lot of energy, which is you have to bring a lot of energy these days, especially with um, the scene that I'm in. You know, people like need a certain level of energy, but also being able to bring a level of like dynamics and, and a feeling of progression throughout the set for me is really important so that it feels like it's a little bit thought out or it's a bit creative in a way. So you feel like you're being taken on a journey, not just like I'm just whacking bangers <laughs> in, into each other. You know what I mm. mean? Um, so yeah, like a bit more of <clears throat> a bit more thought out, I guess I try and make it so that maybe, maybe a few of the people in the crowd might have an experience like I had where someone took me on a journey and mm. I was like, wow what just happened right you know yeah it's mm. one thing you said there was you said in your space hey, you have to bring energy mm. obviously you're more of like a house sort of tech house dj mm. how 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 we talk i talk about this with brent honey actually mm. but how has like sort of i guess tiktok techno impacted your scene um i mean it's just one of those things you know like there's always things that pop up you know, and for me, um, this is a case study for me, you know, like the trends in music. And I feel like there's a pendulum swinging constantly. The pendulum goes up into really high, fast paced music, in which everyone wants to hear it. And then slowly it starts swinging back. People want to hear music with more soul, not so fast, a little bit more thought out. Currently, we're swinging back in the, in the opposite direction. Right. Um, you know, it was hard and fast, you know, 2022, into 2022, people just wanted to hear hard and fast. Um, this year, I've really seen a move, a movement towards people wanting to hear more melodies and more music in their dance music. So like, just the Barry Can't Swim and Salute and <clears throat> these guys are, I mean, like Fred again, obviously, <laughs> these guys have been thriving off the back of this movement of people want to hear more music in their dance music again. Rather than just like heavy kicks or... Rather than just like noise. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and just like high energy, fast paced, go as quick as you can go, you know. And I'm not, I don't, I'm not one to judge, but, <clears throat> you know, scientifically, it's like if you, the, the, the closer kicks are together, the less room there is in between for anything else to happen. So at, at some point, you're just going to have bass and kick <laughs> and drums and there's no room for any kind of like melody or hook or like anything interesting to happen you know so the faster the music is the less memorable it's going to be well i mean it's like that have you heard of the genre up tempo like the hard style genre of up tempo oh i've not i've not listened to it oh it's basically what you just described it's just kicks that are as you said that far apart and it's just bass and then just nothing else (laughs) but yeah gets an absolute crowd going in the hard style look look it gets (laughs) you know like it doesn't it gets the crowd going but do you remember you know, do, do, yeah. do people remember those tracks like 10 years from now? Do they live on? Yeah. You know, um, you know, as a producer and a creator of music, um, what's important to me is that I'm not creating music that has a shelf life, you know, um, of like six months. Um, so for me, I've, I've put a lot of time and effort into just taking note of timeless music and just taking a leaf out of the page of those (laughs) artists and going like, what were they doing, you know, with their music that 30 or 40 years from now, I can hear that track and it just still resonates and connects for me. 
Um, so with my music, and you know, I can't say I've nailed it, but I try to implement so many of those things that I hear in the timeless classics or the timeless artists and try and move that into what I do. At the same time as, as, as meeting the needs of the dance floor, you know. Hmm. So it's like, it's, well, you know, on one hand, you've got your finger on the pulse of what's going on. On the other hand, you're trying to think, I don't want to just follow trend. You know, like following trends is, if you're, if you're trying to, you know, copy the music that's being played today, that music was made two years ago. Yeah. By the time it's come out now, that was two years old already. If you're trying to produce that music and it comes out next year, it's already, you're already three years behind the curve, <laughs> you know? So if you're trying to like copy music that's big now and go, oh, I want to also be big. I'm going to do this too. You're too late. Yeah. It's actually a very know? good point. I never actually thought about it that way because as you know, as a producer yourself, a song, as soon as you finish a song, it doesn't come out straight away. No. There's the whole process of actually getting it out usually like a year or two mm. uh, until it comes out unless you know unless you got like you work really closely with the label and they're super pumped and they're like we want to get it out now and you're like oh okay <laughs> but generally you don't want to do that you want to let hype build around the piece of music you want to play it test it like get comfortable with it you know what i mean um nowadays more so than before you know because i have quite a few releases but you know, some stuff I'm just happy to put out, but other things I want to hold on to and really, you know, get comfortable with and play. And then, then I'm like, yes, I'm ready to release it, you know. Um, a little bit like the, the, the most recent release when we want to talk about that at some point. Yeah, yeah, we'll get, we'll definitely get into it. I was actually yeah. going to just go into it because it's seamless transition. But before we get into that, I sort of want to ask who are sort of like your musical inspirations in terms of artists and different producers from the past or present. Musical inspirations? Because you allude to a lot of like timeless pieces in terms of music. And I agree, I think house music and, you know, tech house is very timeless. Yeah, I think like, I think just like Frankie Knuckles. Mm, this whole This whole era of, you know, um, Louis, uh, Moody Man, you know, just like all these guys they just made amazing records, you know, and they just made music with soul and just like, but it also just connected on a club level. I think Aman Van Helden. Yep. Yep. Look, I don't vibe the stuff he makes right now, but he's just like, he listened to like flowers by him, you know, he listened to his old album in 1992, I think it was. And you're like future, I think it was like future something, future music to future for you even just the title mm. and you listen to that and you're like, look, it's not co over complicated, co <laughs> complicated, <laughs> complicated. Yep. But it's just, it's just genius mm. ahead of its time, ahead of its time. And it's timeless in a way. And he, and he was really amazing at flipping samples, you know, Amar Van Helden, I think for me is one of the, one of the artists that's most inspiring as far as a remix artist and, mm -hmm. a, and a creative for writing music, um, Louis Vega, you know, um, Moody Man, um, Ocean Lade, you know, these guys, these guys that were just the kings of like inserting a sense of feeling into their music, giving it like uh, a timeless aspect. Yeah. 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 Well then, in that case, sort of how have you used those inspirations? As you said, Armin van Helden, have you used his inspirations in all your productions and then obviously we're going to we'll get into your most recent production mm. but in all your all of your songs that you've made whether they're in the vault or they're released yeah i mean i think um the way that they seamlessly integrate like hip-hop reggae funk soul jazz with no real they don't care about didn't seem like they cared about what was right for a genre they were just taking music from you know, taking samples or taking chops or they're taking inspiration from whatever music they loved and just making it work with dance music, making a house or, you know, or, or, or a beat of some kind using this plethora of sounds with no rules, you know. Mm. Um, I think that my music gets categorized as being, um, you know, minimal or tech house, but I like to think of it as just being house music. 
Yeah. I was going to actually ask, how would you describe your sound? Describe your music? I just say house music because um, it, I, I try and blend all the elements of all the different genres of house that I love. I love the I love the kicks and the tight grooves of minimal, mm -hmm. but I don't like the minimalistic minimal. You know, I like to be able to like add a lot of different elements that are like unusual into the music. So you you, you end up with this minimal punch, but okay. then you have like soulful, jazzy kind of hip hop kind of stuff coming through as well, and which is kind of like you got the tech house elements as well, like the more jacking tech house elements. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of a blend. Mm. Yeah. yeah, actually, now that, you, now that you speak of it, I do see that a little bit. It's mm. got a bit of everything. It's not just like one, you know, subgenre of house. It's sort of all of them no, mixed I, into one and different elements and different parts of the track. Yeah, I try and use, um, every time I start a track, I try and use a different library of sounds for each one. Um you know, I don't use, I don't use templates. Um, so I try and have every track sound really different from the other. So I don't end up just with a bunch of music that sounds the same, you know, which is easy to do. You know, you find a formula, you, you like say you have a release that hits and everyone loves it. It's easy to just like create a template and start reworking that formula over and over again. Um, which could be probably a bit of an easy win, maybe, who knows, but I personally, I like to have every track have like a really um, unique personality of its own. You know? That would be difficult though, wouldn't it, to come up with a new, I guess, template for every single track? Yeah, it's it's difficult, but it's also like super fun, mm. you know, because you're Get like creative a whole bunch of new, flowing. <laughs> yeah, a whole bunch of new possibilities. Um, yeah, it's... It's super fun because you're like it's a bass that you've never worked with before. It's a vocal style you've never worked with before. It's chords that are just completely new to you. So there's a whole bunch of new techniques that you need to learn in order to harness those those sounds and make them all work together. Um, so it's challenging, and sometimes you know it comes out as being you're like yes, this is amazing. Or you're like a bit of work to do here. <laughs> like it, th th there's a good concept, but I'm gonna need to like work with it. I think there was one track um, that I think I spent three days just nonstop trying to figure out how to get the hi-hat to sound how I wanted it to sound. <laughs> three days. Just that, just that one hi-hat? That's all I could think about for three days. <laughs> Fair enough. Did you end up fixing it? I think it's okay. <laughs> I don't know. I might have to come back and have a look. <laughs> is that a recent release or is it still in the vault? Um, that's actually scheduled. Oh, it's not scheduled, but it's um, the boys from BU. Right. So Laidlaw. These guys have a label um, called BU. It's really cool. Super quirky, interesting, groovy, snappy, swung house. Mm. And um, yeah, they wanted uh, an EP from me. So yeah, that's one of the ones. What? It's, it's called... What is it called again? <laughs> Red lights. Red lights. Mm. Okay, interesting. When that when that's scheduled to come out? No scheduled date yet. Okay, so it's just in the works. In the works. Mm. It's like when when it comes to releasing records, it's like it's always tentative. Sometimes, like it's like yeah, let's do it. Cool. These are the tracks we love them. And then you know, usually the DJs on tour, your I'm a DJ on tour or whatever, and th sometimes it takes a while for things to get set in stone. So mm -hmm. this one's taken a while. And just because they handle it themselves, but they're also just busy mm -hmm. DJs. Uh, That's artists. fair enough, though. So, yeah. so I don't have any expectations on it. It's just happy to let it simmer away and release when it's ready. Yeah. Mm. I was going to ask, have you found it easier? Obviously, you, as you said, you sort of use a new, um, you use new sounds for every song that you make, basically. Mm. Mm. Has, it, has it become easier as you sort of obviously gained experience or is it still as difficult as it has always been? So much easier than it used to be. <laughs> yeah, obviously, your your I feel like your 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 wealth of knowledge has ex has expanded, but yeah, like I just it's about getting to know your library, you know, understanding what sounds you have at your disposal. Um, so when you conceptualize, you know, I what I do is I conceptualize a feeling that I, I want to make people feel a certain way, a, a sense of 
uh, attitude. You know, music is a feeling for me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a movement. It's it's a, a combination of how I want to feel, but also how I want to make people feel on the dance floor. So it starts with like, okay, I want it to be, I want it to feel like this, you know, and I want the sounds to to move in this way or sound uh, or, or to affect people in that way, whether it be, I want it to be fun and bouncy and a bit, and a bit like um, pushing the boundaries a little bit. Um, or I want it to be deeper and more, mel- like not melancholic, but a bit more intros- introspective, you know, a bit more, depending on how I'm feeling as well. So I'll sit down and I'll write something a little deeper and a bit more heartfelt, uh, or I'll sit down and make something really silly and stupid. <laughs> so yeah. what was your feeling like for your most recent EP? What was your goal and inspirations for those tracks? Well, these four tracks, um, I'm really happy that they all came out together because they're all really silly. Like they just I did get that vibe. Yeah, they weren't too serious. <laughs> nah, nah, there's no there's literally zero seriousness about any of them. Especially I think yeah, what sample was it? Um which I think it's a th- the third track. I forgot what it's called. Slipped up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's <there. laughs> And this and Discovery Channel, I just realized that's a very silly that's that sample itself is very is a bit of a meme. Yeah, it's a meme. <laughs> it's it was my childhood. It was my childhood. I just remember seeing that on um on MTV or or something. It was like the the um when they're dressed up as uh, they're dressed up as uh, apes running around. And it, I just heard it recently and I was like, oh my God. Yeah, it, it, I remember I heard that sample from that track and I was like, that just like opened a memory for me because yeah. I remember that went around a bit. But <laughs> do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. Yeah. You and me, baby. And it was so <laughs> rhythmic. Yeah, it is. I was like, this is so rhythmic. If I, And I was like, so I, I, I'd written something. I'd written this bass and I'd written this beat and I was like, I need something. And I actually wrote it to play it at Lost Paradise. I had a vision in my head. I was like, I feel like this would be a moment where people will connect with this vocal from like their early childhood, mm. depending on how old they were, <laughs> of course. But um, I was like, I, I really want to see this like be a moment when I play, you know, like Lost Paradise. It was 6.30 to 8. So it was like sunset vibe. So I wrote the track with the intent of playing it on New Year's and I did. I closed the set with it and it worked really well. I was really stoked with the reception from the crowd. Everyone was just like, everyone was just vibing so I was really happy but um yeah I obviously with a sample like that you can't just go boom and put the sample on top of the beat you have to do something with it Mm. um I put a vocoder on it so it sounds like a robot voice yep Uh, but the robot voice changes consistently in pitch so if you listen to it you'll hear the robot voice going higher and it'll go lower throughout the entire thing okay so yeah there's a lot of like it moves the 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 voice itself moves and shifts so that one it masks the sample but then it also for me it's about taking samples and doing something interesting with them not just going here's an easy win put it on top of a track yeah do something creative with it is my you know because you sample a bit don't you throw your tracks you've got a a lot I wouldn't say a lot, but there's a good collection of your tracks that have a lot of samples in mm. them. Yeah, yeah. I love, like, I love sampling. <laughs> there's a good amount of tracks that I've done the vocals for. Um, Portal Gun, like, I did the vocals for. A bunch I, do, I did the vocals for. Um, sometimes I get frustrated because I want to, I have an idea, but there's nothing out there that exists already. I don't want to work with a vocalist that takes too long. So I just do it. You, oh, you, you... Okay. I sing it, yeah, All or right. I say it or sing it, yeah. So a lot of my tracks are actually my own voice. Oh, that's sick. Yeah, uh, and I pitch them, so you, I just go up and down with the pitch and I put, like, effects on it so you don't know it's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. What sort of, um, yeah, what's the creative process behind putting your own vocals behind, like, in a track? Because obviously it's not, you know, it's not a full song, it's just, like, a line or two. It's a couple of lines, or two, yeah. ca- like a hook or, like, a um, enigmatic mm. something. Mm-hmm um it's usually like you do the first take and then you do 50 more takes and you go back to the first one and you're like that was it <laughs> like, yeah that's actually very true if, yeah. like any creative any creative uh industry it's the same your first is always the best the f- one <laughs> first is always the best man you have to get over the fact that you hate your own voice too like i'm like oh my god this is terrible 
but then I like show it to people and they're like, this is amazing. Like portal gun. I was like, it was a place it was, you know, I just put it there placeholder. Well, I was like, I'll get someone else to do this. And then I just, I think I put it on a story or something. And then the amount of people that like hit me up being like, this is sick. I was like, really? <laughs> okay. And then so I put up like a thing just being like, all right, anyone who wants this, you know, hit the thing and loads of people just like swiped and I sent a free download out. So I was like, this needs to see, see the light of day. Mm. Gave me the confidence to kind of like do more of my own vocals. Yeah. And that what was that like your... You've obviously doing vocals before that, or was that like the first sort of vocal you did? I'd done some stuff, but that mm. wasn't the whole track. It was like, <clears throat> there's a whole spoken word piece. Um, there's like, there's all different, like I did ad libs and I did layers. There's like, it's quite complex mm. how it all worked and I couldn't replicate it. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But it's pretty interesting that you use your own vocals and mm. I feel like it just adds to the creative burden, lack of a better term. Well, obviously you you have to work it into like the actual music that you're also writing. Mm. So like it just adds that extra creative creative element rather than burden. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think like uh, I love sampling because with samples you can't replicate. Like I couldn't create that sound again. You know. So like a lot of these sounds are like a click. Like you're sampling like four sounds together, like a like an organ, a piano, some drums are a sample, and the effect the effects and processing that we used on those in like the 1980s i couldn't do that again so you're taking the tone and the feeling of that sample and putting it into your music that's just like what house music was built on you know like sampling disco and stuff like that so i feel like it's a very integral part of dance music is sampling it'll always be around um but i also like to sample and write it's like a it's like a bit of a combination so mm -hmm. i use samples and then i write around mm -hmm. the samples vice versa mm -hmm. and then i use vocals that i sample and then i write my own mm -hmm. vocal, vocals into into it as well so have my vocals someone else's vocals a sample and then chords and progressions that i've written so it's like a real melting pot of original and then sample material right yeah yeah, yeah. that's very interesting see mm. i'm not a producer myself so a mm. lot of the stuff you're saying is very interesting because mm. I guess as someone who listens to music, it's so easy to just look at it and be like, oh, it's just, it seems like it's just four or five elements on a track, but mm. I'm sure as a producer and the way you're describing it, it's a lot more than just four or five elements, just the little ones you don't hear and yeah, the changes in, in pitch, as you said, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, like with my music, it's generally more than like, it, I, I can never just do four or five elements. <laughs> is that um, even possible? Mm. Well, it is, but it won't sound. No, it can sound amazing. Like other producers do it and they do it really well. I I like to have a lot of ear candy in my music. I like to have a lot of like hidden elements that are for the intent listener. So, you know, I want the obvious things, obviously, which is important. Just to spotlight like the melody or the hook or the certain things that push the track along and make it memorable, give it the identity. Mm -hmm. But then around all of that sits uh, a lot of detail that happens like subtle and in the background. Uh, my focus with music production has been to create an experience with each track. So not just a piece of dance music um, that slaps in a club, but also like a listening experience for people. So, you know, if you were just like chilling at home and <clears throat> you wanted to like listen to something interesting, then I'd hope that maybe someone would like, you know, oh, listen to some of Caleb's music because there's detail in the music that I know that I'll hear, you know? It's like when you when you keep listening back to a really good book. Yeah. Or, or reading, oh, sorry, I, I listen to audio books, but like <laughs> when you read a really good book over and over again because there's, you get new things every time from the repeat of reading of it because the, the author's given you so much to work with, you know? Yeah, for sure. And you don't really, under, you don't, from first time reading, you don't understand it. Then first time reading it, you get like, you get the experience, mm. but then if you keep coming back, you get more, mm. you know? And I think that's, um, that comes from, like, it's a very, in, it's intent from the artist, you know? So for me, it's like, I want to give you a, a repeat listen reward, you know? So if you keep coming back and listening the first time you'll hear the, you'll hear the obvious things. Second time you'll hear some other stuff happening. Third time, maybe you'll catch on to like an overall 
um, mapping of, you know, because I have a lot of mapping, so things left and right and they move in the stereo field, mm. you know. Music is like we we experience, the be- our best experience is when we, when we experience music in an environment at a festival when we hear it coming towards us from places. I like to put people in that environment with the track, you know, so when you put your headphones on, <coughs> put you into a space. Um, so we're not on modern technology now for music producing where you can create spatial feelings within the music. So things are, <coughs> when you <coughs> put your headphones on, you can kind of hear things happening in different spaces around your head, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of that. Kind like of different like little bells or rings or the whole would you say like major elements do that bells rings little details that are happening around maybe the vocal starts here and then like <coughs> shifts across and ends over here um just like lots lots of mapping so you feel like you're in the mm. song you know rather than just like being delivered a piece of music yeah yeah it's an audio geek thing no yeah. i i actually like it's very inspiring to hear that I feel because it's I, I love how much detail you put into your music I mm. think that's amazing and I think someone as a listener you don't value that until someone actually explains that they look at how much detail I'm putting into my music and <clears throat> it just makes the music a lot more valuable in a sense have you always been like that in terms of music production or is that more of like an acquired skill that you've picked up on it's an acquired skill initially I was just trying to make things that like the hardest part is to get things that sound good in the club mm. You know, there's a lot of processing that needs to happen to get things sounding fat, you know, and just bringing the, you know, sounding big and full and having the right energy. Once you've got that, you feel like you've nailed that, then you start going, all right, because I've got that down long, you know, now maybe I can move into like doing something a bit more creative with my arrangement and doing something more creative with the layout of the sounds, you know, I think, um, the next step in music is going to be, you know, these spatial spatial experiences. You know, we've come, we've come so far with audio. You know, to make people feel like they're having like a uh, I feel like they're inside the music or the music's around them. You know, uh, I think there's like eight D. Yeah, eight, I was just going to mention that eight D audio, mm. which is like crazy. Eight <laughs> D audio, you know. Uh, <clears throat> 8D audio doesn't translate too well to a club because things need to be in, <clears throat> in mono yeah. <laughs> to come over on a big system and sound good. So there's a limit to what you can do with club music. You can't have things coming from like, well, coming from all over the show. It'd be pretty crazy though if that actually was a thing. <laughs> well, I think it could be. Mm. I think that's the next exciting step is to have these really like amazing mapped experiences and, you know, like, providing a, a a more 3d music experience in a club i think would be really special yeah mm. yeah it's never really thought about it that way but the way you describe it is what so like a sound comes from this speaker and then eventually travels to that speaker yeah and then just travels around the, the club mm. <laughs> i was in a, i was in a club in new york last year that had a four point system so it was behind me and off to the sides as well and the the music was coming from all sides and the guys that were playing, I think it was Bradley Zero was playing. I can't remember what the name of the club was, but it was fantastic. Like they were playing these, they were playing these tracks, and I heard that there was like a drum roll, and the drum roll started in, on the front speaker and then went around the room, and then like ended back in front of me again, and that was part of the mapping of the track. All oh, right. And then it just crescendoed and like at the end of the crescendo it was all back in the in front mm. but it went around the room it blew my mind i was like what the hell <laughs> how do i do that with my music i yeah. like i want the drum roll to go around the room you know imagine that yeah that's that would be an experience and a half wouldn't it oh yeah you know it's super impactful i feel like when a big on a, on a big festival stage when like something goes over here and then over there and then it kind of like a vocal starts there and it moves across or a vocal goes boom, boom, boom like that. It's very dramatic. Mm, dramatic that's that's dramatic the effect. experience. And the yeah. overall like feel, vibe. Yeah, overall feel. It makes it feel more dynamic, you know? Mm, yeah. For sure. Going back to like your EP, it was released on Elro, right? Elro. Yeah, congratulations. It's a big label. <laughs> How was it like working with them guys and getting that EP released on that label? 
I mean, fantastic. These guys are these guys are the best. I um I was on my I was on a flight. Uh, about to get on a flight, and I was sitting at the airport, and um, I get a message from Dilla Swing, like DM on Instagram, being like, he's like, hey bro, what's up? Is he? Does he work with Elro? He so he was the found one of the original founders. Right. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, and he he runs the label side of things, I think, with, with a crew with mm-hmm. with a team. Um, but yeah, he's the the main guy for like creating the music for it. He reached out direct. And I was like, I was like, what up, man? Just get in the coffee. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, yeah, is that his first just, time interacting with him? First time interaction. Oh, wow. I was just like, he was super casual. So I was like even more casual back. And then it was, uh, and then he, um, he was like, hey, been, you know, I've been playing your music um, throughout the summer and wondering if you had any records to drop across. And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> just made a quick playlist and sent it across to him and he pretty much got back to me straight away being like love the music um and then within like a couple of days we had a had a final select of four i think um spent a couple of weeks just kind of like getting the mixes right on them getting them dialed in the team like he's got a whole team there they just are so professional and they're really lovely and you know they sign off their messages with like big love and like hugs you know they're just really lovely and yeah. i'm like this is so nice to deal with these people that clearly they're in it for the love it's not like some professional mm. you know it's professional but it's not it's like professional but it's also the music industry we do it for the love you really feel it with elro you know and um yes yeah, so i feel like it was a it was it's been a really good experience um they shared everything yesterday but like late because it was it was Barcelona, Spain, yeah. yeah, Barcelona. So <clears throat> they shared everything. So I think I'm gonna share everything tomorrow at my end, you know. Because um, it only came out what on, on the day of recording today, yesterday. Yeah, like <laughs> late yesterday. Mm, mm. Yeah, but uh, Elro, amazing to deal with. I yeah, I couldn't have asked for a better kind of like a better situation. I, I mean, it was just perfect, like the way it all came together. Um. I've always wondered where, like, musically my home would be as an artist because I didn't really feel like I anywhere really resonated super highly with me. Like, the labels I really love, you know, I love their music, but I'm like, I don't think that I am belong on that label. Mm. But I think Elro, I'm on Elro Limited, which is more like the house. And then there's like, so there's Elro, Elro, which is like, I guess they're more known for the tech house, you know? And then it's Elro Limited, which is like more the house, the less tech house, more house. Subtle difference. Yeah. yeah. Still Elro, still just Elro, but like a subtle, subtle difference. Um, it's the same Elro that run the, that throw the parties. Or the, oh yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. One. yeah. Yep. The same Elro that do the big parties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they just, I mean, they just smash it worldwide. <laughs> you know, they just, and they just bring, it's just, it's just amazing energy. Mm. Yeah. So I'm hoping, you know, like, um, I'm going to be in Europe late May, um, early June. Uh, so hopefully I'll better team up with a couple of the guys. And um, I think the last one is going to be touring over here at some point. So helping him, well, he doesn't need any help, but, you know. <laughs> assisting. Assisting yeah. with shows and things. So, yeah. Yeah, that should be cool. Because I think, as you said, like you said, you haven't found a home, but your music, you feel like it belongs on Elro, which is mm. funny because you describe them as this very playful sort of mm. a silly brand or silly um like the way they conduct themselves but still very professional which is funny because that's the way like your most recent ep with them mm. has that vibe <laughs> very like silly just fun yeah no, not too serious not too serious you know like it's you know it's definitely like there's there's a certain amount of serious approach to the to the level of production and the effort to the to the you know but then it's also just like we're here to have a good time you know we're here to connect and we're here to dance and you know i want to provide quirky fun moments for people you know i see people just like smiling and joking and you know that that for me that it, i think any, when any dj asks you know advice i'm like just think about with your music what music you play how do you want to make people feel on the dance floor how do you like to impact people hmm. you know do you want do you want to see them just like bouncing around like with a smile on their face or do you want to see him like 
don't know, it just depends what you want to see people doing on the dance floor. And then that's my guideline to what kind of music you want to play or you should stick to. Yeah. It's actually funny you say that because, yeah, I saw your set of you on the valley at Dr. Dan's. Mm. And my friends were like, oh, I was like, we should go to that set. Like, let's go to that set. It'll be a cool set. But I think they were, they weren't skeptical, but it was more like I had to sort of drag them to there. But they enjoyed it. They loved it. Because mm. the vibe on that set as well was crazy. I remember we walked in, I think we were a bit tired at that point because mm. I think it was like second or third day. Yeah. And then it definitely like lifted up our energy and spirits to sort of keep going. We just oh, nice. it on. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was an awesome set. Great set. As you said, you didn't play, you didn't play for an hour though, didn't you? Hour of power. Yeah. But it was a great hour. Great. Yeah. I, um, Dean, who was on before me, was crushing it. And um, prior to him was another girl who was crushing it, but she was playing like commercial mm. edits. And I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> I don't know if I can match this energy. I don't have edits like this. I'm not doing edits at the moment. Like I'm staying away from them, you know, um, pushing the original stuff, you know. And um, and then Dean got on, thankfully. Not that she was amazing. She was doing crushing at what she was doing, but I was like, I don't know how I'm going to follow this. But then Dean got on. And then played a super sick, like housey, kind of like techno y housey set. And he was just doing all this creative, really creative mixing. I mean, I like to get really creative with my mixing as well, but he was like on another level. I was like standing there being like, do I have to follow this? <laughs> do I have to do shit like this too? Can I like just do it a little bit, a little less? Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, and then but he was killing it. And, I, and, um, and then it came my turn, and I was like, what am I going to play first? I don't know if I'm going to play first. It's like, I didn't expect, my expectations were just like a half full dance floor, like a side stage, mm. you know. Um, so I had something prepared for it, but it was more, a little more mellow. He was playing 135 BPM. Mm -hmm. The place was f pumping and full. It was like the last hour before sunset or before the sunset, you know, golden hour. And the energy was really high. So I was like, I need to come in and like, I'm like, no one knows who I am here. Well, at least I thought. So I'm like, I need to come in with like the right piece of music from mm. the start and then follow, follow through, you know, to really, to hold the crowd and, um, brought in the first track and it was, um, Block Party by Sydney Charles, which has been like an absolute go-to for the last year. So I'm like, I'm happy to share it because I've used it enough. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fair enough. So did you plan that set at all? Or were you sort of, I mean, no you plan. said you planned it, but. No, no, I didn't plan that. I just, um, you know, I just had, I just had a lot of stuff that I, I knew works mm -hmm. and has been working for me. And I just pretty much condensed tracks, all the tracks that have been like the ones that have been working <laughs> down to like one hour's worth of heat, you know, and I just, I just went hell for leather. Mm. And just went, you know what? I've got an hour. The crowd is so up for it. I'm going to stay true to myself. This is going to be an hour of power. So I'm going to go like high energy, the high energy version of what I do during the day, you know? And I, and just to see everyone, the whole crowd was just like bouncing, which is for me, like, I just love to see everyone dancing. Like, yeah, the hands in the air moments are great. You know what I mean? But just like, like the heads bopping. I just like to see people's like, I just like to see people like grooving. I don't want to see people, everyone looking at me. I want to see people like looking at their friends, like dancing with each other. You know, if I see people like dancing with each other at the front, obviously amazing, but I'm always looking to the outskirts. If the people in the outskirts and all the way at the back are like vibing, job done. Mm. You know, because the people at the front are always going to be throthing generally. It's like, getting everyone involved and I, I really felt like at BTV I looked out over the crowd and I just saw this moot like this mass movement because it, it, when it gets to that size of a crowd and above it's like you're not looking at individuals anymore you're looking at like a movement across the whole you know like okay everyone looks like the whole thing's bumping so I think I'm doing okay <laughs> you know mm. yeah it's a cool view though from that stage because it's fairly mm. it's fairly high up mm. like in comparison to where the ground is so you would have gotten a good view looking out to the whole thing it was pretty it was quite surreal you know like it's surreal just like looking out and um seeing like people just coming as well like people coming over the hill and being like oh, and then they're like well, they're like they're all just like entering the zone um and then i was really lucky because i had a bunch of friends who my melbourne friends and who i um, met at pitch and you know we've all met and 
I don't think a lot of a lot of them have, we've partied together. We've they've never come and seen me play before, and um, they all turned up backstage, and I I turned around at one point and they were all just dancing their asses off all around me. I turned around, and everyone was just like, yeah. I remember seeing your entourage and they were like going absolutely crazy. Everyone was going crazy. <laughs> Everyone was going crazy. And I was like, oh my God, I just couldn't be any happier right now. It's like, there's nothing better than being in a booth and just having all your favorite people around you just bringing great energy and enjoying themselves, you know, not just supporting, but actually just genuinely enjoying themselves. And then looking out at a crowd and seeing everyone just smiling and having an experience and hopefully one that's memorable for them and they can take it away from the festival and you know that's what festivals are all about yeah it was a very memorable set though a great set thank you yeah I loved I'm glad it. <laughs> I'm glad you were there yeah no it was awesome yeah. I, I, made, I made I made sure I'd get there luckily it was at a good time because I felt bad I missed a couple of other people's sets that were a bit earlier in the day because it was just um, yeah just it was like day three day four and I was it was 1pm and I just mm. could not get there unfortunately so I felt really spoiled I didn't expect like the guys who got on after me were the owners of Untitled I noticed that because I remember I was looking at the stage. I'm like, those guys look super familiar. Yeah, they're like the head honchos. Yeah, well, I think it was Phil Palermo was one of them, and I think I forgot who he was with. But I remember I looked up and I was like, those guys look like really familiar. Chris or something. Maybe yeah. it was. Yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> I don't know them personally, mm. but they were like, um, I was like, I was like, I was trying to find to figure out who was that one after because you know you get to the point you're like someone's gonna start like kind of coming in at some point to just you know, start plugging their USB in and then no one was coming over. <laughs> I was turning around and then just saw this guy with headphones in his hand. He's just like dancing. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, and I was like, looking forward to hearing you set, man. And he was like, ah, just, just going to be two old dudes dropping old bangers. And not, not realizing that they're nah, the head of Untitled. <laughs> didn't know, didn't know. And then they just ripped like all these classics, which was the best. Mm. I thought it was fantastic. I loved it. Yeah, it was really, it was really crazy seeing them go up there. I was like, I was a bit in shock. I was like, whoa, yeah. fair enough, go for it. <laughs> Might as well, man. Put yourself, yeah. put yourself on at some point for sure. Yeah, no, it was great. How did your BTV set differ to Lost Paradise, if it did at all? Oh, yeah, it was quite different actually. Because mm. you ended up playing on the Lost Disco stage. No, Lost Disco stage, is it? Lost Disco. Because you played yeah. Paradise Club the year before. Paradise Club the year before, mm -hmm. um, which was amazing. That was a night set, so it was a different energy. It was a little bit more like moody, a bit darker, but still like still fun, mm -hmm. uh, but more tailored towards the dark. Uh, whereas whereas uh, Lost Disco this year was 6.30 to 8, right after the opening ceremony. So the Welcome to Country. So there'd been, there'd already been like a, a day's worth of music prior, a whole day's worth of music leading up to, and then they cut the music for an hour and do the Welcome to Country. Uh, and then I was the first artist to get back on and start the nighttime schedule, I guess, of, of Lost and do the, I did the sunset and I didn't expect, I didn't expect anyone to be there. Oh, like, really? I was like, oh, I'm going to start maybe with like a hundred people. I, um, I get there like 20 minutes before my, st my set starts. There's already like a half a stage of people just waiting there. <laughs> With like dove sticks in hand like <laughs> ready <eager. laughs> ready to go and then it was more people just coming it was it was just like standing up there looking out over the dance floor and just seeing like the exodus from the campgrounds and all the people just like shuffling and moving their way into the dance floor and then there was like a countdown to like 6 30 when i could like play music oh wow yeah okay and i was like <laughs> Like that, you, you got to put a bit of a bit yeah, of extra mail on it. You got to <laughs> dramatize it, you know what I mean? And I'd um, I had like created this this intro, I made this intro because I knew I was starting after the um, after Welcome to Country. So I'm like, I don't want to come in with just like a beat, you know, or something lame. I was like, I can do something creative here. So I made this kind of like it's like congas and there's this vocal, um, talking about you know, partying for days on end, everyone being really high. <laughs> and it just so loops fitting. <laughs> really fit. I, I was like, you know what? This is fitting. It's one of my favorite. It's the vocal from, from uh, Ocean Latte, uh, Mama's Grooves, uh, which I love. So just took the acapella, wrote some chords and, um, you know, put some drums in there. And then that kind of segues into uh, an original track I just wrote like a couple of weeks prior that had, hadn't played out anywhere. Um, 
so yeah so the intro went into like a brand new track that i just made and then from there it goes into like a bit of a collection of my favorite kind of like day energy vibes you know and a bunch of i played pretty much all of my elro releases and just yeah and then i think it was it was pretty high energy from the start but i got to build it Mm. it was more of a journey it was a bit more thought out a bit more how how long was that set hour and a half okay it's a bit longer than a little bit longer but definitely like i feel like as a listening experience for someone you know b2v was very much if you're there in the moment it makes sense but lost paradise was like a thought out listening experience you know so i recorded that set and put it up um Mm -hmm. so i'm quite proud of how that one turned out yeah did you Mm. Because I'm guessing then you played it on the 29th, or first 29th. first official day. First official day. Yeah, yeah. And then what did you did you jet straight to Melbourne or did you spend a day? Uh, I spent a couple of hours. It's kind of like I went and supported Flexi. Yep. Uh, yep. Went up there and hung hung just danced up there for a bit and said hello and we um, saw Channel Trey mm-hmm. and then I had to drive back to Sydney, get on a flight, fly to Melbourne get a car, drive to BTV, play BTV, get back in a car again, drive back to Melbourne, get on a flight, fly to Sydney, <laughs> get in an Uber, go to another gig. <laughs> <laughs> that's chaotic. That's, a, that's the full DJ home, experience. <laughs> get another Uber, go to another gig. It was like, I'm like, there's really no point at which I can sleep in any of this. I'm like, there's not really any. When did you play on the fella stage at? I played on the 28th. Oh, okay. So you played on 5 p.m. in the afternoon. I think right. Okay. I was going to say, I was like, where does the fellow stage kick in? But so you lost Paradise for two days, basically. Mm. And mm-hmm. then you were just everywhere after that. <laughs> just like. Bit of a bounce- nomad. <laughs> yeah, just bouncing around, you know, which was like, which is cool. It was funny because you're like, I was at Lost Paradise and all my friends were there for like three or four days. And then you'd like leave halfway through the night, get to BTV. And then everyone's kind of like there for three or four days. And they're all like sinking into like a bit of a session, you know, like the whole festival and you're just there for like a chunk mm. and you're gone again. And then I just remember the funniest moment actually, which is just, this is just such a classic. You, uh, I played the, um, the countdown for the Ivy pool. I played the new year's countdown <clears throat> and I did the last track. There's a big button that was for the fireworks and I got to hit it. Oh, sick! When the um, <laughs> when the when the when the countdown hit zero, and then I like the fireworks went off. Everyone was just like the place was going off, like the pool was cranking. And I turned around and I was on like, the upstairs. Yeah, like yeah, the up- on the upstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I turned around and I was like, job done. And I was like, I turned around, and I was like, holy shit, it's New Year's, and I don't know anyone here. Oh wow! <laughs> I was like, which is fine. I was like, I don't know, a single person. So I just like unplugged my USB, handed it over to LF Sound System, who I'd met before. So I kind of knew those guys. I was like, what up? You know, <laughs> <Happy New Year. laughs> have fun. And then I just grabbed my USB and then just put it in my, and I just, just like pulled my hat down over and I was just like, out of there. And then just got back to Bondi where I live. And I just kind of like sat back and I was like, wow, what a journey. Mm. Mm. That, how exhausting was that whole, those whole four days? <laughs> Honestly, I was just buoyed up on all the energy of all the different environments. And I just feel super grateful that this is something I can do, um, you know, f- as for a living. And yeah, it's exhausting, but there's always like an end date. Or, you know, I knew that on the first at midday, I was free to just chill. So, yeah. Mm. But it would, it would it, it'd be um, pretty crazy because I remember I was talking to Flexi about this um, last year. Mm. But he said it's crazy when getting pulled from a room when you're like playing at a crowd or something and then you get pulled into like a hotel room or your room and like all this energy mm. is just dumped did you get that feeling at all when yeah. you like left the ivy on the, on that new year's i mean like the ivy was obviously it was crazy and it was pumping but like i was already kind of used to it at this point um it's more like the lost paradise set was a really big like lead up and build to that and i was a lot of preparation had gone into that and it was it just came out and it worked out much better than I ever could have expected. But after that it was just like uh you put all your energy into it and you're really like giving a lot as you're performing, 
you know and then at the end once it all comes you know once it's done and dusted and you've delivered what you came to do it's kind of like you kind of just want to go and sit somewhere and be like ah. you know and just go Whoa, what just happened and just <laughs> like take a reflection a, take a breather but quite often it's like you're straight into like everyone's just like well let's party you're like Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, for just it. exhausted yeah yeah like let's party but really like and i'm sure flexi would agree like it, you kind of need like a half an hour just to kind of like recalibrate yeah for sure you know and just go and sit down and not not outside of the party but just somewhere just chill for a second let it all sink in away from all the noise from the noise yeah i think you feel like you get very like pent you get very like high strung you know because you're just been in it it's more like the, um, you know, you want to deliver the best possible experience. So you're really focused, high level of focus, but you're also feeling very like connected to the crowd. So you're very receptive of their energy, mm. you're giving a lot, you're receiving, you're giving. It's like this relationship, you know, between you and the crowd. At the end of that, and you just kind of disconnect from it. You need a moment, <laughs> I feel like. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's very... Mm. Very crazy those last four days he had <laughs> to yeah, bring in the new year. It was perfect. It was it was like uh, at the end of that, I was just, I was like, wow, like I couldn't ask for a better way to finish such an amazing year. And the whole year had just been all these really amazing opportunities and and gigs and and all this travel and all these new lessons and you know all these steps and all these challenges. You know, I had so many different challenges that. <clears throat> consistently feeling uncomfortable which i think is healthy it's a good level of, un- of being uncomfortable though good level of being yeah. uncomfortable i think this year is going to be the most uncomfortable year of them all i think because it's the most uncharted territory what do you mean by uncharted territory like <clears throat> well like it's my second year of going full-time okay yep mm. i do this full-time and um last year was amazing but you know, I'm aiming to be in Europe for, you know, two or three months. Um, and I just got offered my first booking in Europe. Um, in Ibiza the other I, night. Oh, Ibiza. Mm. That's, that, that, congratulations. That's massive. Mm. It's, a, it's a big show. I can't disclose who it is yet. Um, supporting? I can't say. Oh, well, that's what I meant. You can't disclose who you're supporting. Can't disclose too much about it. All I, all, all I can say is that it's the first official thing. And then there's been a lot of other um, offers on the table that I just need to like, I just pretty much need to just secure everything and just turn it into like a bunch of dates that make sense. What you club know? in Ibiza are you going to? Or you can't disclose it either. <laughs> just, just <laughs> we'll keep waiting. We'll wait. But um, there'll be an announcement soon. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Man. But it's just like the beginning of a new journey of like, going into a new market um you know i've played i've played overseas before you know and i've played like villa parties in ibiza and i've done like stuff in london um but this is like completely off the back of like the last year or two's worth of work and bookings you know purely off the music um not just like favors from friends you know what mm. i mean or people who you know it's like it's happened through the releases and so i'm i'm, I'm really happy about that and um so yeah, it's, you know, it's obviously having success in Australia is really good. I have a really amazing team, finely tuned to just the best. Um, I'm super appreciative. Portia, who is no longer with us, um, super appreciative of her. She's really helped a lot to help build to where I am now. Um, so yeah, having a great team in Australia is amazing. Um, but yeah, tackling Europe, you know, it's a much bigger pool of artists and going over there and just trying your hand is going to be a whole new experience, I think. I'm feeling pretty confident, pretty excited. It'll be, yeah, it'll be a great experience, great learning curve as well. Mm. Are you heading over there as like an independent artist or do you have a booking agent over in Europe? Um, I'm talking to a few different um, booking agencies, trying to figure out which one to go with at the moment. Um, keeping options open mm. right now. just want to know a bit more about who I'm going with. It's very important, you know. I don't want to um, make the wrong choice too early. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going to be Berlin based. And then, yeah, there's opportunities in Amsterdam, there's opportunities in Barcelona, there's opportunities in Ibiza. And um, 
you know, there's opportunities in like Zurich and uh, and lots of opportunities in the UK because that's where a lot of my music comes out in the UK. <laughs> so, yeah, it's going to see what happens. And then, um, but yeah, for the next three months or four months in, in Sydney or Australia, playing shows around Australia. And then, yeah, the aim is to get to Europe. Get to Europe. Mm. That should be very exciting. Mm. Yeah, very exciting. Do you have like a, I guess, a bucket list venue for while you're over there? Unless you've, already, unless you've already hit it. <laughs> uh, well, there's uh, there's tentative, like, there's tentative things happening. There's, obviously, I want to play like Sissy Foss. Um, you know, Watergate is a potential venue on 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 the cards. Um, there's the Ibiza thing, which you know, can't really say for now, but which is a great venue. And um, you know, there's Amsterdam, obviously. Like, I'd love to play the likes of Shelter and these like institutions. Um, you know, London ninety three East would be amazing. Um, so yeah. Honestly, I'm open to, you know, as the right crowd, doesn't matter about the venue so much for me. Mm. Yeah. Do you think you'll make a lot of music while over there as well? Hopefully. Yeah. How? How? Because would you would you classify it as a, a holiday or more of like a, a work trip? <laughs> this would be a, this would be everything's work nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, but like in a positive way, everything is like. This is no days off almost. Um, I work for a label as well, so I'm constantly like doing things for them, and then I'm doing things for my own career. So it's going to be. I think like being an artist is about learning how to turn what you do into your everyday just workflow. You know, without I hate to I hate to use the term hustle mm. because I feel like that's the negative term you know um hustling no one likes to be to be hustled you know i think connecting um authentically you know and resonating with other people you know in a way that creates opportunities is the attitude that you go into like you know moving into new areas or going to new cities you know so hopefully um going to Europe and places like that or like moving into new spaces, just like connecting with other artists and resonating with them and having opportunities arise from those organic relationships, mm. you know? Yeah, that's mm. a, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, hustling, as you said, it's been coined very negatively as of late. Yeah. It's, and very, I mean, it's a bit of a toxic word, I guess, in a way. Toxic word. It's also a toxic behavior, <clears throat> you know, because people are like, obviously it's a competitive envi- environment. Um, I work as an A&R for a label and stuff like that. So I see like artists that are really keen, you know, and they really want to succeed, but they're really they're pushing quite hard, you know. Um, but like pushing in a way that sometimes doesn't come across authentic. They're trying to like, you know, maybe the art, not putting enough time into the art, putting too much time into the push, you know. Mm. So I think um, when people are just doing things because they love, they love it, and from their heart, from from it, from the right place, it generally tends to resonate in a positive way and make you know you kind of generate an environment where people like want to help you. Um, and I definitely feel that from certain artists, you know, and they don't even need to ask me. Like I'll reach out to them and be like, if I've got an opportunity, I'll give it to them, you know. Or mm-hmm. if I think if I want to hear their music, I'll ask for it, you know. Yeah, yeah. sort of like what stick stick true, stick be authentic, and everything else will sort of come, fall into place. Yeah, like. <laughs> Yeah, just just be authentic, do what you love, and you know a lot of it will fall into place. You know, um, and I know that sounds counterintuitive, <laughs> um, but yeah, it seems to be the thing that works best. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because you mentioned you work A and R for Sweat It Out. Yeah, I help. I help A and R for them. Um, so like, it's just talent scout pretty much. And securing, you know, securing um, artists and finding artists that have talent and um, finding, getting good records from them, you know, and then working on those records to get the final product. Um, Some really, some really cool dudes in Australia and outside of Australia and girls, girls and guys. Um, I'm launching, Sweat It Out have been really, have been amazing. Maddie and Jamie and the team are just absolute legends um 
And they've understood that I have a bit of a sonic or a sound that I really believe in and push. And they go, it's not quite club sweat, you know, not, not quite what they've been doing for a while. So they're like, you can create your own thing that's connected <clears throat> and it's called cut a rug. Cut, cut it rug? Cut a rug. Cut a rug. <laughs> so cut a rug is like a term. So like to dance is like right. cut a rug. Okay. And um, so we sweat it out and I was like, cut a rug. It just seems to, it just seems to roll. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I've got this VA that's going to be uh, a three track release every four to six weeks. Um, and three artists, three tracks. Each track, uh, I've asked the artist to give me the song that they would use to get the party started. The track they made that they like, you know what, if I need to get them the floor moving. To cut a rug. <laughs> this is what I would use, you yeah. know, and um, the party starter. So, yeah, so my focus is to do, you know, consecutive releases and then build out the catalog of that sound. And um, my approach has been like Lion and Lamb. So getting a bigger artist and then and then pairing them with smaller artists, you know, two big artists, one small one, vice versa mm -hmm. on each release so that it draws the eyes of those people to the new person. But the music is, is of the same quality. The music's all, you know, sitting at the same level, but maybe the artists aren't at the same level, you know. Yep. Yep. So hopefully giving um, people that need a bit of exposure, some exposure. Yeah. So is that you're gonna be, is that VA gonna be released under Sweated Out or through Sweated Out? Yeah. Um, but it's gonna be like it's gonna be a little bit separate. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the first release is on the 23rd of February. Right. And who's featured on that one? <clears throat> so I got a collaboration between myself and Furza. Furza are these this duo from the UK who have dropped two EPs and both of them have gone straight to Beatport number one. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and all all the tracks are amazing. Okay, I've awesome. been I've been playing them in my sets for like the last year, and I was a bit sad to see them go live because I'm like they're not just mine anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they're, not, they're unreleased. No get more gate, gate, gatekeeping. <laughs> yeah, I was like I, I rocked up to a gig, uh, rocked up to a gig, and this girl was just playing one Furza track after another before me, and I'm like, fair enough. Were you I planning knew. on playing Furza on that track on that set as well? Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know what? I always knew this was going to happen. She was like, how good is it? And I'm like, yep, yeah, they're good. So I got a collaboration between me and uh, me and them called Funkadelic Relic, and um, <laughs> this has been like a staple in my sets right. uh, recently. It's the track that I rely on to get the party to move, started, to yeah. move the people. You know, okay. I can get it works. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And what are the other two on there? Uh, one from uh, Jacob Tompkins, who's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a Brisbane-based guy. I think he's moved to Sydney. Um, it should be in Sydney now, actually. I think he's a super talented producer, really, really sick producer. I think, and he's just a young guy as well. Um, he's just really found his sound recently, and I'm just blown away by his production. So, I got a track from him. Um, it's called You Got It, it's going to come out on the VA, and I've been testing it, and it's just it's perfect. Okay, great. And the third track is uh, a, a good friend of mine, um, Kim April. She's a um, Dutch DJ producer, um, rising up through the scene right now. Uh, she's just a super cool chick. We met in Ibiza at like a villa party when I was playing this villa party once, and we've been friends ever since. And um, yeah, she sent me this record, and I was like, "This is perfect." Mm, yeah, it's that's called, awesome. It's a vibe, babe. That's what it's called. <laughs> Wait, yeah. That's what it's called. It's a vibe, babe. Yeah, awesome. And what what sort of I guess a vibe are those tracks as you said like party starters do they all have their own individual sort of are they all unique in their own way yeah yeah they're all they're all you know they're all like 130 bpm um very house housey swung groove kind of vibes um classic house bit of chicago bit of detroit bit of tech bit of tech house in there You'll get the, you'll catch the vibe. Okay, awesome. Yeah, look forward to what yeah. day is that? The twentieth of Feb, twenty third of Feb, twenty third of Feb. Yeah, awesome. Keep mm. an eye out for that then, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and th and that's that. Is that a Spotify release or a SoundCloud release? Everything. Oh, it's, it's all a, platforms. All platform release. Mm. Okay, that, that's even better because, mm. yeah, I think as someone as you work in A and R, how difficult it is to get a track up on like onto Spotify. Spotify is easy. You can put oh, really? a track on Spotify tomorrow. Mm. 
Okay, because I feel like, yeah, a lot of the times, a lot of artists release music just on SoundCloud, but not on Spotify. Mm. Is that more of like a personal choice, do you think? SoundCloud, like you do it more for like edits. You know, right. SoundCloud, like you have an edit you made, put it on SoundCloud. There's a lot more traffic for edits, you know. Different platforms have different traffic coming through them for different things. SoundCloud is like you just put anything on SoundCloud, <laughs> you know. Spotify is a bit more of a process, but it, it's doable. Mm-hmm. But you wouldn't just put you wouldn't put edits on Spotify, um, copyright issues and things more so with them. Um, but yeah, so Spotify uh, with music releases, you could just self release to the cars come home, but no one will hear your music, you know. So the idea of working with a label and working with like a team is that they help push your records into the to the right people that you wouldn't reach organically on your own. As in different artists and DJs or just another, like in terms of listeners? Um, listeners, just listeners. listeners and other DJs, you know. Um, so like say if, a, if someone wanted to, uh, you know, produce a DJ, wanted to release on Sweat It Out, uh, they have their 3,000, 4,000 followers on Instagram, maybe 2,000 or 1,000 of those are actually interested in their music. So that's, just, that's a really small pool of people. At the end of the day, they're going to really be hearing your music. Um, but if you work with a label... The label is going to push it out to like radio. They're going to push it out. They're going to pitch it to Spotify playlists. Um, they're just going to, you know, use DJ promo um, dispersion kind of like um, services that help to push the music into places that they, as an artist, would never have otherwise, you know, got their music to. Right. It's kind of also like having a stamp of approval from uh, a trusted source that this is good music as well, you know? Yeah. My, I always say, with music is that no one cares until everyone cares. Um, Just because it's not until someone with a reputation goes, this is good and everyone else decides it's good too. And to that point, you just have to believe in yourself and back your stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Cause I was going to ask, obviously if you compare a record label to like even 15 years ago, Mm be tw- like tw- like yeah 24 years ago like back into the 2000s obviously mm. a lot of them are making money through actual physical sales mm. whereas now obviously with the new age of spotify and yeah. soundcloud and digital music it's a lot harder i wouldn't say harder but there's different ways that these labels now make money and you just have to rack up a lot of streams as an individual artist or as a as a label as a label to make as money label. as an individual artist you don't really make much money off streaming mm-hmm. um you know, hopefully that's going to change soon. But, you know, it, it, the, the industry is evolving constantly. You know, you can't cry about the changes. You just have to adjust, I guess. Um, as artists, like, I don't rely on, I don't rely on making money from my releases directly, but indirectly I make money from them because they, you know, they get me access to new things or they book me shows or they move my career forward. And then I book bigger fees as a result, you know. So that's how you make money off music. For me, you know, m- releasing music is something I do for the love of it, to, to put music out there and, and hopefully, you know, one or more people, you know, resonate with it. Um, making a living from it comes from the touring and the shows. Mm. Which is a bit different to how I, I said back in the day, a lot of a lot of artists would make a lot of money from physical copies and physical sales. Whereas now, yeah, yeah you can't quantify it like mm. that anymore. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think you're really making money until you're like five million streams down. Mm. You know, and then maybe the labels cover their costs, <laughs> and then then you start maybe getting paid at ten million streams. <laughs> And then that might pay for, you know, the last uh, bit of hardware you brought, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's weird how it's, how it's the, the g- digital age has completely changed the way labels operate. Absolutely. Like, you know, it's a little bit disheartening sometimes, you know, sitting there in the office with the team and stuff. And I'm like an airy fairy artist world, just like sitting down making music, not thinking about money whatsoever and just like making it work somehow mm. but then like you're in the office with the team and they're like crunching the numbers on artists are like like oh no i mean this person only got you know 10 million streams in that last release it's like i don't know if we can do another one and i'm like 
I haven't even got 10,000 streams on like the last thing I put out, you know what I mean? So it's like easily get disheartened by the lack of engagement across streaming platforms. Um, but you know, you have to just look at it from a different perspective. Obviously labels, they make money that way, but as an artist, you have to look at it from the perspective of like, if 10 people resonate with your music, one person resonates with music, that's got like that, that's job done, mm. you know, and be happy with that. And, from that point forth, anything else is a bonus. You know, otherwise you start doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, no, that's actually a good point. Yeah, I think mm. getting too caught up in the numbers is is dangerous. Super easy, super easy to do, especially as you get bigger, because more people are invested in your career. Um, you have an agency that makes money from your bookings. You know, they take a take a cut. Um, the label, you know, they make money from your sales. Everyone like promoters are making money from ticket sales. You know, so everyone's like, obviously. It, it's an industry everyone works together and, and makes money together and it's all very helpful but the bigger you get the bigger the stakes are the more pressure you feel to like reach these goals and like sell tickets and sell records and make everyone happy mm. you know i guess in that sense what would be like your tips for sustainable growth as an, as an artist because it's very easy to just sort of as you said get caught up in numbers and then as you said as you get bigger and there's high stakes but mm. to make it sustainable so that when you do get to that point you're ready and Prepare, as prepared as you could be mm. what are your tips for like sustainable growth as an artist well I mean like I'm still like <clears throat> relatively very early in the journey um, but I'm very conscious about my mindset going forward you know and I'm at that point now where like I'm encountering a lot of these things personally and I see it with other artists you know the the problems they have so I think it's just like continue to do it for the reason you started doing it and like hold on to that you know <clears throat> remember why you started doing it and continue that path because that's what got you the success that you're getting now you know so if you start shifting your mentality i think stay authentic do it because you love it you know stop don't make a track to try and like get on triple j or something specifically to hit targets because generally that's not how you started you know you didn't you didn't start making music to hit targets you did it because you loved what you were making i think it's where people lose their way they start making music to reach goals for their career mm. for their brand and then that's where like it derails them you know so yeah stay authentic do what you love and whatever that might be yeah because yeah. yeah as i said it's very easy to, yeah because once once you get to a point and face barriers and stuff. It's, mm. If you do, if you have the wrong mindset, it's very easy to just make a, make the wrong choice. Even super easy, man. Mm. Super easy. And like people get managers and things, you know. And the manager manager goes, "That business savvy, you know." The, the manager's like, "Let's take you and go steroids, <laughs> you know, and just blow you up, you know." And um, and I think every artist gets excited about that. Like, yeah, I want to blow up. Let's go. And then the manager's like, you need to do this, 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 make this kind of music. Stop doing that. You mm. know, don't do that anymore. Sharpen up. Like, don't look like this anymore. Look like this. Hey, Fish is killing it. Do more of what he does. So people start getting kind of like shifted and, and, and narrowed down into this like product. I think in, in today's consumer world, obviously being a product is very important the people i think it's that when it becomes your focus is when it stops stops working you know yeah yeah so it's good to have it's it's obviously important to have a really good team around you have a good team you know like i'm oh, honestly i'm i'm so thankful for the team i have i have a super supportive group of friends that i'm constantly just like very grateful for <laughs> I think about all the people that have come and supported me throughout my career, like throughout my journey as an artist and all like the little gigs and the side things and like people have come and they've supported and I'm just like, look back now and I'm just like, wow, like I'm so grateful um, for the support. And even now, friends just come and like just show up, you know, and I have, so I have amazing friends and then I have a team of people who, um, you know, have decided to believe in my music and believe in my journey and support me going forward 
um, you know, and then and, and any and any promoter who books me or any you know anyone who listens to my music and chooses to support going forward is um, I'm just really grateful, you know. Mm, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. How did you sort of come about the team that you were with now? Was it did you did you pick them <coughs> or they picked you or? Um, I went to Lost. I think I went to Lost Sundays, uh, Mardi Gras, not this one being, but the one before. Mm-hmm. And I turned up there with like a bunch of my friends after playing like um, one of the Mardi Gras parties. I played a couple of Mardi Gras events for my friend Jackie Cunningham, girl thing. Yeah. So and I went to I went to um, Lost Sundays, and I turned up there and I walked in and I was like, Troy Beeman was playing, and I was like the vibe was immaculate in there. And I was like, this is, I want to be a part of this, you know. And someone introduced me to Seb, and um, <laughs> and I was like, "Hey, bro! Like, really nice to meet you." And without being too forward, I was like, "I love this. I'd it, I'd love to get involved somehow." And I think he looked at me. He looked me up and down. I was wearing like a tiny blue crop top, <laughs> and then something else and some mesh and like like these big earring hoop earrings or something. And I think he was trying to figure out what I was. You know what I mean? <laughs> what minority group I belong to, kind of thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, and then and then he just sized me up. I think, and he might see he might say it differently, but it was pretty funny. And then nothing ever came of nothing came of it at the time. But then we over time, I just continued to, you know, turn up to Lost Sundays and just you know get involved. And eventually, a um a booking came about, you know. And then the booking was my like proving ground, and they put me. I think I was playing a warm up set, like, but not too warm up, like, at a good time. And um, from that point forth, you know, that was when, like, hard and fast was really, like, the mm. ravey sound was really prevalent. Mm. And everyone was just jumping on the train of just throwing down. And I think Lost Sundays at that time was every time an, a local artist was booked, they'll just go, I'm just going to play the biggest bangers that I have. You know, I'm just going to go in there and go, bleh. I got on and like I'm I'm a I'm a house you know house head and had a vision for what I wanted to do and I was like I'm gonna keep it house music you know and I stuck to my guns and um, I think I got off and then Seb was really stoked because he's also a house head you know <laughs> and um, from that point forth they just have been supporting me and when it came time for me um, to sign with an agency you know I had some agencies showing interest. And um, I asked, I remember going to Seb and being like, what should I do? Who should I go with? And he was like, actually, I think we want to represent you. And they're like, we don't have an agency arm at the moment, but I think give me two more weeks and I think we can make it happen. And, and I said to him, like, I kind of got to make, I got to make a decision, you know? And he's like, give me two weeks. And in two weeks time, he came back to me. He's like, we're good to go. If you're happy to come with us, come with us. And they had already been supporting my music and and being there giving me opportunities i was like you guys have had faith in me i'm gonna have some faith in you guys and i'd rather be a part of this journey with you because so far it's been good and it's been about a year now that's awesome it's yeah been, yeah phenomenal yeah so that, that first impression was it great i guess yeah <laughs> i think so i think so so to tip if you want to impress a uh, booking manager just rock up in the craziest fit. <laughs> yeah, just rock up, confusing the shit out of people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you were fitting the theme because I'm sure. Well, I guess the vibe was the same. Lost Paradise, people were dressed up and. Well, it was Lost Sundays. It was oh, like, sorry, not Lost Paradise. Lost it was Paradise, Lost. Lost it was the, it was the um the Mardi Gras weekend. So you know, I was dressed to fit the occasion. Yeah. Yeah. So you fit, you fit the crowd. Yeah, of, yeah. It was. Yeah. No was, arguments about that. It was no <laughs> argument. No. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah, that's crazy that that's sort of like what sparked the journey with finally tuned but mm. it's paid off I'm, I'm oh well, i can see it's paid off definitely paid off and, you know hopefully it continues to pay off and you know hopefully um you know down the track i get to continue the journey with them and it just becomes a, a symbiotic you know, it, we both like really benefit you know my vision for the future is to kind of like turn around and see the team that have been with me the whole way through and just celebrate together you know and be like we did we did this mm. you know um there's no no journey is solo you know there's no my, my mentality is a rising tide lifts all boats 
You know what I mean? Very well said. We do it. We do it together as a community. I don't. I, I don't understand. Like you know, um, competition happens at the bottom. You know, like people supporting each other as artists. We all do something quite different. We all have varying different levels of success. You know, you can't compare. You know, and I think what's important is that we all rise together and and like engage with the culture together and bring something unique to the table and we can all complement each other as artists the more we support each other you know and um my team the finally tuned team are very much a very super i mean they're super supportive of upcoming talent pretty much everyone who's making waves right now in the in the sydney scene has come up through lost sundays as a as a party a brand yeah they, they do book internationals it's fantastic but they look after their locals and like bigger them up and blow them up, you know, which I think is really cool. Mm. I've noticed that as well. They they very much love to incorporate local upcoming artists on their lineup. Definitely. For Lost Sundays. Like, yeah, they'll have a massive, as you said, headliner, international, maybe even Australian, but yeah, it will always be supported by someone who's local, who needs that opportunity to hit that next level and they'll always give it to them. So I think that's amazing about Lost Sundays and finally tuned in. How they do even for like um lost paradise lost paradise yeah like to play at a festival is, is a massive accomplishment for any any dj totally so to be able to represent local aussie talent sydney talent as well yeah i mean i remember me and flexi just being like last year um after we played on you know paradise club you know he played and i played and we we're both just like what just happened <laughs> You know, like that was phenomenal. It was like a real high point in both of our careers at the time. And we're both just like, that was game changer. Mm. And ever since that, that set, that gig, things have just like leveled, continued to level forward. And I have finally tuned to thank for that, you know, trusting us with that time slot, big time, you know, we got to do something really special that resonated with everyone who was there, which helped to like generate the groundswell that's led to where we're at where we're at now you know mm. Mm. Well, as much as it was like a i guess physical change in terms of how much your career's advanced how much of a mental change or how much of a mental impact did that have um obviously i'm assuming positive but from that lost that initial lost paradise gig with you and flexi um i guess it was just like yeah i mean it was just realizing that this is like sustainable you know, uh, and then this year it was a bit of a trip, obviously walking around and I was, I played the set and I had a couple of sets and I did the class and then I had to, you know, go somewhere else and, you know, festivals and things. I mean, I've just been a lover of music since forever and I would always just go to festivals and, and relig- religiously just attend festivals and go big nights out, obviously clubs, warehouse parties, everything for the love of the music. And it'd always be something that I would be like funding with some other thing i had going on you know and it'll be the fun thing that i did but i had to work all week to do Mm -hmm. to make it happen uh and then just like walking around this year and being like well i have nowhere else to be but here you know Mm. like this is now my reality is this is my workplace Mm. and um i'm making money or like i'm i'm supporting my lifestyle by being here and doing this yet this is what I used to do for, for fun. So now it's like, I've, it's like perfectly integrated what I want to do for fun was how I support my lifestyle. Yeah. And it was like a trip. It was like, I was like tripping out. I was like, this is great. <laughs> I'm walking around right now. Just like enjoying this is where I should be. This is where I should be. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm just like seeing all these people having an amazing time, bouncing around, listening to great music. At some point I get on and do my thing, but the rest of the time I just get to hang and appreciate other people's art and interact with the community yeah and then when i'm done here i i I take a break you know because this is you know i I go home and have like a couple weeks off yeah (laughs) i was like that would be a trip though it's a trip it's like i'm I'm assuming obviously you 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 dreamt of that sort of moment where yeah i wouldn't do that well i didn't even dream i didn't even dream about it like it's just one step one foot in front of the other Mm -hmm. of loving to do what i'm doing like loving producing and loving you know getting the opportunities to play gigs and um the dream was to just have a life of being more um involved with music and other musicians and creating music and sharing music 
And it's just led organically to all of a sudden I turn around and this is just what I do for, for a living now. Wow. You know. That's very that's very inspiring because mm. I was going to ask, like, with your goal setting. Goal settings, like, <laughs> oh, it, like I do, you know, I, I just want to continue, you know, people say, what's your goals, you know? I just want to continue to to make music and connect with people through music and connect with new communities and reach new people and also like receive from other communities as well so be inspired by other people continuously so as far as goals go you know like obviously yeah it'd be amazing to play like a bunch of really amazing shows um but i think the way i see it is if i continue to just do things from a point of view where like i just want to continue to connect with other people musically those things will happen organically yeah whatever's the best thing will come will come along and i'll be ready for it you know so yeah like there's definitely things i'd love to do but yeah i'm I'm there's no timeline for it there's no timeline yeah music's like the the music's forever you know like the life like the the journey is is forever i'm not like there's no five-year term there's no Obviously, I'm you know and try and make it to Europe this year to like try my hand over there and get involved with the community, mm. have more of a presence uh, over there. So that's like a goal, I guess. You know. So, so you yeah. don't really have any objective goals, I guess. Your goals are fairly subjective in a sense. Subjective, yeah. yeah. Like ready to pivot, ready to move, and adjust with what's working at the time. Um. Yeah, like. I guess I'd, I'd say I'm like extremely ambitious, but I don't, I'm not aiming to be on any particular stage. Mm. You know, I don't have like, I haven't written a list of things that I need to be doing in two years time from now. You know, it's not really my style. Yeah. Um, I would never have dreamed of like, I would never have expected Elro to reach out, but they did. And now I'm just like stoked, yeah. you know, and the next thing that comes along will be the next thing. And I'll be stoked about that too, you know, and, be, it might be unexpected or it might be something I hope for, but we don't know yet. Mm. Wow, that's very inspiring. I think it's a good way to look at it. Like you just sort of got to stay, stick true to yourself, mm. be authentic and eventually everything will sort of fall into place. You really As you said earlier, yeah. You can't script this stuff, man. Like with the music scene, like you just can't really predict how it's going to go. You, you just can't like make these plans, you know. Mm. You don't know how it's going to connect. You don't know who it's going to, whose ears it's going to reach. It's just out there in the ether. You put a re- you put a release out like my Alro release got released yesterday. <clears throat> I don't know who's listening to that right now, <laughs> and who might contact me tomorrow, you know, to do a release or something. So mm. you just gotta like put your best foot forward always, you know. And every step that every opportunity you get given, just do your best to the max, and then the next thing will come along. Yeah, and you gotta be super prepared as well. Like the minute you start feeling that the traction of things working just double down you know as soon as i release a uh, as soon as i a score a release and i deliver those tracks i make f- four more of the same sort of vibe like just or i just, just i just make, just make tracks i just make music because i'm like well those are gone now i need to like have an arsenal ready to go <laughs> and i need that i need that music to be like perfected so that when the next opportunity comes along the next label reaches out asking for demos I've got like the music's ready to go. Yeah. You know, so I think it's like preparation and circumstances at the right time. And then that's the luck of like opportunities, you know? So, yeah, that's awesome. Mm. I think that's a great way to, I think, end the conversation on a very inspiring note. Yeah. For anyone listening, hopefully you feel super inspired because I definitely do. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I think it's, it's a good way to like sort of just, it's like a good, check with reality i guess because for, uh, for me for example i'm i'm someone who can get, can get very caught up in the numbers i know we just spoke about it mm. but i get caught up in the numbers and sometimes yeah i might do things for the wrong mm. reason or it's not mm. authentic or genuine enough mm. and sometimes yeah it can be very hard to get out of that as well because once you're in it it's hard to get out of it but man like figuring out what is authentic to you is the, is the toughest part you know what what is it that you do and what want to do and once you identify that sticking true to it you know and growing it and like you know you know figuring like adding more to that 
I think is the toughest bit, you know. And at the moment, I'm at, at the moment I'm feeling like I'm in the right, doing the right thing. But there might come a point where I might stray mm. without knowing it, and I have to like check myself and bring bring it back in again. Mm. Might get a bit caught up with the success. Maybe a bunch of things, the opportunities will come, and I'll get sidetracked and like things. And all of a sudden, you're just like off on this other path, and you're like, <laughs> wait a second, this isn't quite aligning. So like, you have to kind of like bring it back into on even keel again. But um, that's just kind of like the whimsical nature of, of the music scene and working in the music scene and making music and being an artist. It's like there's a million ways you could go. There's so many different paths. You just kind of have to like pick a lane mm. and be consistent. Yeah. Mm. I think, yeah, it's very, yeah, I think it was very inspiring to hear all that stuff because it's all good and well thinking it. But when you hear, some, hear from someone else, you just get a bit of more confidence that like, it is it is good to do what you do and good good to be authentic because it's work for someone like you yeah so it's obviously gonna it's work for someone like flexi as well totally Flex, so. flexi is like mm. another super authentic dude you know who just like has just been doing his thing and like <laughs> you know behind every overnight success is 10 years of work oh yeah i've always heard you that. know like me and flexi have both been just like doing our thing for like so long and like we're both of us have you know gotten traction like post covid you know which has been great um but behind that was like you know 10 years of like hit and raves you know pretty consistently <laughs> networking and outrage and all that sort of well, stuff well like not like like just just like i don't know like i, I couldn't even call it networking <laughs> you know like i was just just being there you mm. know like being just th- frothing music and happening to like run into and get to know people mm. networking is another thing i'm like it's important to meet people and like make yourself known but uh it's touch and go with networking you know because it can come across also like a bit contrived so when people go out for the purpose of networking it's finding that balance of like going out because you love the music and you love the scene and then organically meeting the right people and then being engaged and you know that's that's important but that's going back to the hustle thing you know yeah yeah, uh, yeah you want to make sure you're out for the right reasons Mm. meeting people authentically making genuine connections genuine not, connections, not a yeah. connection just be like all right you can give me something so i'm gonna make connection with it's you. really obvious when like someone is only interested in you because they think they see you as a path mm. to something you know and um but then they don't have time for this other person like um i have I hope heaps of time for you but they don't have any time for the other people that might be with you or something like that and it just but it comes across you can kind of tell yeah, yeah yeah um so that's like a word of like caution to anyone that's just like trying to like come up you know i think just be aware just be aware of how obvious <laughs> it is but you know it's we all have our own journeys yeah, yeah and i think as i said if you stay genuine and authentic and you don't do things and you do things for the right reason not the wrong ones and as you said it's you're not going to come off as, um, you know, leachy, like no. a better term, but. And I think, and I think just another really important thing as well for like, um, people like getting into it and, and a lot of people have this a term, there's, there's people say, oh, it's a saturated market, you know, it really isn't. It's, it's, there's a lot of people talking about doing things and having intentions and half-heartedly, you know, doing it, but there's not actually that many people just like going all out. Mm. And being consistent and if you're going all out and being consistent it's like it's a matter of time it's not if you know so if you go all out and be consistent it's just like a matter of time you're actually you're actually there's not that many people doing that so it's not a saturated market you know and eventually you'll find your your group of people that resonate with what you do and that'll grow you know be a couple of friends and be some friends of friends and then there'll be some randoms and then the randoms tell other randoms and all of a sudden you hit a critical mass and then you reach a bunch of people you know so yeah just like be consistent and um it's not a saturated market there's room for everyone yeah consistency is key as well that's another one i think is important just stick to it yeah Yeah. don't try and don't chase trends you know like one don't try and follow i've had pressure to like play harder and faster for to book shows you know and um this is not for me you know i already play like hard and fast in in the realms of house music you know like i'm on the harder and faster end of the spectrum 
and uh, it wouldn't be I don't I don't resonate with anything more than that mm. um, so yeah I feel the pressure as well and um, I just kind of stuck to what I wanted to do and it seems to be working so yeah awesome yeah it's a great way to finish the conversation yeah perfect. some inspiring stuff from Caleb ah. Jackson <laughs> hopefully you guys are all inspired as well because I definitely am after this conversation well thanks for inviting me on man no thank it. you thank you for being yeah. on it's been it's been an awesome conversation it's been nearly two hours so holy shit yeah <laughs> damn so, yeah it's been awesome so um yeah obviously guys thanks for listening obviously if you're still at this point mm. I commend all of you um <laughs> thank you so much for listening it means a lot hopefully you guys got something from this conversation I'm sure you have there's plenty of wisdom in the last nearly two hours but you know as usual make sure you guys like subscribe share the episode around make sure you follow caleb as well but other than that hopefully i'll see you guys in the next episode take care see ya